Hi friends, my name is Chandra. I am in California, which if you'd have talked to me two years ago, wouldn't have been a place that I would have thought that I would ever live. But I'm here, I've been here for less than a year and um, I'm so grateful to be with you all tonight. I imagine Shalom as a circle, a space of inclusion, people, earth, perspective, and question. A celebration of diversity, of listening, of completeness and well-being. Peace. Shalom is what is possible. It's what we have been working and praying for. It's already within us and it will not happen until it embraces all of us. It belongs not to us, but to the community and to God, to the welfare of all. Shalom brings creativity and vulnerability and wild, wild hope. Shalom is right relationship with others and with God. It is sharers and marchers and listeners and companions. It is being, as Larry said this morning, gathered and sent. And while I know the call and have lived my life in response to that call of Zion, Shalom isn't primarily what I want to talk about tonight. Tonight, I much prefer a conversation about audacity. As Brenda shared, by definition, audacity is a willingness to take bold risks. It is daring, being brave, having courage and pluck. And it has another definition. Audacity is rude and disrespectful. It is impertinence. In Luke 7, we read, just then a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet, weeping, raining tears on them. Letting down her hair, she dried his feet and kissed them and anointed them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited her saw this, he said to himself, if this man was the prophet I thought he was, he would have known what kind of woman this is who is falling all over him. Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Oh, tell me. Two men were in debt to a banker. One owed 500 silver pieces and the other 50. Neither of them could pay up and so the banker canceled both debts. Which of the two would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose, the one who was forgiven the most. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he said, do you see this woman? I came to your home. You provided no water for my feet, but she rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting, but from the time I arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for freshening up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. If the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. Then he spoke to her, I forgive your sins. That set the dinner guests talking behind his back. Who does he think he is forgiving sins? He ignored them and said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. There will be any number of people who will do a lovely job with exegesis of that scripture, but I have to admit to you tonight, I don't love the story. That woman is being talked about. She is audacious for sure, but she is a path to a point Jesus is making about faith, and it's not her story we're hearing. However, I am drawn to what happens next in my imagination for her. She gets up. She stands up and walks out. Going in peace, she moves into what is next for her. She gets to continue to speak herself into being. Audacity is Lema Bowie, Nobel Peace Laureate, peace activist, social worker, and women's rights activist. Lema led a nonviolent movement that brought together Christian and Muslim women to play a pivotal role in ending Liberia's 14 year civil war in 2003. This led to the election of Africa's first female head of state. 
It also placed women squarely in the forefront of movement toward and bringing about peace. And here's the thing, those women were, were what the culture would have called rude and disrespectful. They took bold risks in a way that caused a disturbance. They stood 200 strong, demanding that men reach agreements of peace. And when she was threatened with arrest, she threatened to disrobe, an act which would have brought a curse to those men. It worked and peace talks moved forward. Audacity is teen environmental activist Greta Thunberg who in a speech before the UN, she, a teenager, in September of 2019, slammed the member sitting there for caring more about money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth than collapsing ecosystems, mass extinctions, and people suffering due to climate change. She started her own activism in her family, working with her parents to adopt lifestyle changes to lighten or lessen their carbon footprint. And then she moved into striking at her school, something her parents didn't like, but she did it. They wanted her to be in the classroom. She had something to say. In 2018, Greta did a TED talk and she said this, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, OCD, and selective mutism. That basically means I only speak when I think it's necessary. And now is one of those moments. Audacity is poet and writer Audre Lorde who wrote about her experience facing breast cancer in the transformation of silence into language and action. As she shares about being forced to look upon herself and her living, with a harsh and urgent clarity, she writes this. I was going to die, if not sooner than later, whether or not I had ever spoken myself. My silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. She continues, what are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day an attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence. Perhaps for some of you here today, she says, I am the face of one of your fears because I am woman, because I am black, because I am lesbian, because I am myself, a black woman warrior poet doing my work. Come to ask you, are you doing yours? Audacious, brave, impertinent, truth telling. Jesus too was audacious and he surrounded himself with audacious people, women, fishers, those in poverty, the sick, the ostracized. In fact, without audacity, there would be no Christ-centered community. We wouldn't understand what Shalom calls us to, the last, first, the healed, the ones made whole, the attention to authentic action, the bold compassion, audacity, the very first hand that rose to vote for women in the priesthood in community of Christ. The gay couple who held hands before God and declared their love and life commitment to each other long before their church celebrated and honored that love the transgender teenage boy who attended spectacular and the gender fluid teen who didn't and who told us that there was no place for them there. The woman who sat with me at a PF Chang's and whispered in between courses her Me Too story in the face of the hierarchy of the priesthood. The parents of my best friend who upon hearing their son is gay, not only attended the 1999 gala retreat, now Harmony, but sat with him, prayed with him, loved him, and allowed themselves to be transformed. The first peoples who reminded us that we do not own the land. The congregation in an impoverished community that gathers, even today, to provide food to those who need it. The historian, the hymn writer, the preacher, and the one who won't preach, the deacon, the organist, the president, the author, and you. 
all of these, all of them have been audacious, are audacious, because they hear the call to what is possible, because the energy that swirls inside of them is the same energy that swirls inside of us. It is the energy of God and becomes over and over again in big and small ways, the creation energy of love. This morning, Larry McGuire said this, something I'd never thought of in this way. Audacity is God's gift to us to make shalom real, to come into alignment with what God is already doing. I love this. Pluck, God's gift to wholeness. The thing about shalom is this, it isn't going to come quietly. In alignment with the second definition of audacity I shared with you, the process toward shalom is going to seem rude to some. It will seem disrespectful. It will challenge the status quo, flip everything upside down, align with Jesus' creativity and call. Here's what I know. I've had sweet moments of shalom in my life. Campfires, Zoom pastor meetings, sacraments, community meals around tables, hymns of love. But really, if I look even at these, I recognize I still see through a glass darkly. I can imagine it, but I do not yet know shalom. It may be within me, but it is not realized. I can read words of promise in scripture, but not understand how it will come to be. So I've given that space up to God. Every day I wake up, and I show up with the heart and with hands for justice and peace, and I know I'm moving ever closer to God's reign, and that to me is the best definition I have of faith. But I do know audacity. I know it when I see it. It may surprise me at first, but I respect it. It is protest marching in the streets, and it is tagging art on walls. It is the voice that speaks up for the right of communities that are not their own and then steps aside. It is the one who stops that joke. It is the one who becomes an ally. It is the teenager speaking for gun reform, for environmental change, the one that stands up and bullhorn in hand proclaims Black Lives Matter, the one who refuses to take less pay for equal work, the one who shares their story even under threat of violence. It is the policy changer. Too often, in my experience, people of faith shy away from conversations around these issues and ideas, especially on Sunday morning. We relegate those conversations to a midweek class saying that politics don't belong in church. And I would actually agree. If we are talking about the politics as they are ensconced in this country, they don't belong. I'm talking about politics of fear, hatred, violence against others and judgment, the things that become stumbling blocks as we turn our attention to the hope of shalom. But this time and this evening is the place to talk about Jesus and the politics of love that reigned in his heart, the politics we learned from his life, the politics of hope, love, inclusion, unity, peace and justice belong here, maybe more than anywhere else, the politics of audacious Christianity, the circle of shalom. You know, maybe there will be no shalom without daring, without bold proclamations for justice, without rudeness, without pluck. So let's begin with audacity, just to be sure. What I hope you hear from me tonight is this. Now is your time. It is your time to begin dreaming about what it means to be in right relationship with yourself, with others, with creation, and with the God who created you. It is your time to listen to the stories of those who are audacious around you, Jesus and his community, stories of activists for peace, friends and family who are exploring what it means to be an ally, a marcher, what it means to stand for something beyond themselves, what it means to be an audacious disciple, 
And it is your time to write down your audacious story too. I was going to read to you in closing from Doctrine and Covenants 163, three and four. You've heard the words before. And sometimes when we hear things over and over again, it's easy to tune them out because we're pretty sure we already know how it's going to end. But if you have a pen, write it down. 163, three and four, Doctrine and Covenants. I invite you to spend time with them tonight. I rather am going to read the last words of the hymn we sang with Daniel. Because here's the thing. If you sing a hymn, you're complicit. The words you sing come from you and your heart. So I want to show you and tell you what you sang tonight. My heart shall sing of the day you bring. Let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. How will your audacious self walk in this world when the fires of justice burn? God invites you to that work. Are you willing? May we be so dedicated. In Jesus' name, amen.